So Michael said, um, have to meet certain criteria yesterday to speak on this topic. Pretty sure I have a sub seven, maybe even sub six minute mile. Um, I have a lot of firearms until I lost them all in a boating accident. <laughs> um, and we just had our sixth child in the middle of an ice and snowstorm that trapped us for nine days um, on our property. And our midwife hiked, man, like a mile to get to us to deliver that baby with me. Um, so so do, I, do I meet the criteria? We, we've been without power four days, not quite a week. I think you said you know. Uh, so good. Okay. I'm making progress. Thanks for that affirmation. Um, so I'm John. I am so blessed to be here. It has been so good to spend these two days with you. Um, so I'm really not a complicated person. I'm married to a beautiful wife. That explains why we have six kids. Um, I have six kids. That probably explains why I have so little hair. Um, and man, like when the Lord saved me, the thing I wanted most was to be able to live a peaceful and quiet life, working with my hands so that I might have something to share with those in need. And then three to four times a week, spend one to two hours folding laundry while people are still inside of it and throwing it across the room at judo and jujitsu. Um, like, like that was just my dream. And that is not the world we live in. It is not a world that is peaceful and quiet. And so I find that Psalm 144 has become what often comes to my mind. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Because we are in a battle for the soul of our nation. And what will our nation be like and look like moving forward? And many of you over the last two years have began to think long and hard about important questions about how that's going to impact you and your family and your children. And so you come looking for people like me who started thinking about these questions around 2007 and, th and thinking about what would it be like to live in a world where I am considered a threat, not a friend? What would it be like to live in a world where to a company, I am a hindrance rather than an asset and something that needs to be cut off rather than brought on? And so my whole life has been built around seeing that the world that the Lord saved me into, I did not grow up Christian. Um, I grew up in a, you know, agnostic Catholic household. Lord saved me when I was in college. Um, and, and I was born into this evangelical world that I immediately knew was passing away before my eyes. And that the world that I had been born into was going to be ephemeral. And before I knew it, it was no longer going to be what we knew. And so I began building a plan for resistance because I think the Bible requires us to resist. It's a fundamental principle of the gospel that we are not to be conformed to this present evil age. That we are to not fear, but to take heart because Christ has overcame the world. That when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We really actually want to see his kingdom come and his will be done where we live. In our families, in our communities, in our churches, in our local governments. And so I wanted to be part of a fertile resistance to bring back a better world for my children given that what I saw around me was fading away. And as I thought about, um, I speak at a lot of conferences every year, and speaking to you 200 people has been the most vexing talk I've ever had to come up with. Because um, normally I know what my audience is going to be like, and I know why they're there, um, and, and, and I generally know how to solve their problems. But the problems we face today are so complex and, and at times, you know, they're so daunting, apart from knowing that God has overcame and promised us victory. What could I say? And I realized I can't say anything better than what the Lord has already said. Because we're not the first people of God to find ourselves in this place. If you turn to the book of Jeremiah, God's chosen people, the Israelites, found themselves in a very similar place. 
They found themselves after a history of repeated decline, repeated disobedience, repeated rebellion, correction, chastisement, a downward spiral, you might say, very similar to America. They finally reach the breaking point and God sends them where? To exile in Babylon. They find themselves surrounded by foes on every side. They are a minority with strange views and customs, with no economic and other resources, certainly no institutional strength or pull in a place such as Babylon. And what does God say to them? Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses for yourself and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take for yourself wives and have sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give daughters to your husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you might increase and not decrease. Seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away as captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. Now, I'm Baptist. Don't hold that against me. Um, so, but, but, you know, I read this passage. Imagine any modern missions board coming up with this strategy for winning a pagan nation. Can you imagine this? You want to win the pagan city of New York. Go there, grab some space, start having kids, and build a household and make the city a better place. Could you imagine that? That is what God is telling the Israelites they should do to be salt and light in a pagan and hostile land. I want you to notice something about the commands. Do you notice he says to plant gardens and eat? When is the only other time I believe in the Old Testament we see these two words occur together? It's the Garden of Eden. Where are the Israelites geographically? They're in Babylon. Where does God want them to be practically and spiritually? They're to be a new Eden. They are to continue the work God gave Adam and Eve and continue building the garden, the place where God's presence dwells and God's kingdom reigns in spite of the opposition they find. They're to have sons and daughters. What's the first thing you do with a son and daughter? So, so what does the pastor say? Like, we baptize you, number two, or do you name them first? Because, <laughs> and, and where does naming take place? It's, it's the garden. The, if you've never caught that, Jeremiah 29 is rich with Garden of Eden imagery. He wants to remind his people that even in such a bad place, the original plan has not been derailed. That things might look bleak, but God's promises to them are not a bust. That things might be bad, but God has not abandoned his plan. That they might have been buffeted and beaten, but God has better days ahead. And they are to stay faithful to what God has called them to do and be. So, in the face of a hostile culture, a corrupt and out of control government, limited resources, low morale, how did God tell his people and how does God tell us to respond? We are to be fertile, productive, fruitful. We are to buy space 
We are to build productive houses and we are to be busy blessing the communities we find ourselves in. And so that's what we're going to talk about. What does fertile resistance look like in a day and age when things have become difficult? Now, again, I didn't grow up a Christian. I did not have a fertile childhood. I spent the vast majority of my childhood eating low quality food, playing lots of video games, and watching lots of dumb cartoons. And maybe the only thing that benefited me was like Mario Kart a little bit to surviving on modern roads and a little bit of GoldenEye, um, you know, for taking up modern firearms. But other than that, not a whole lot of redemptive value. Um, And so some of this is reflections from somebody outside the church who by God's grace was transplanted into the church and noticed things that he felt the church was lacking to offer to its people to successfully navigate the day and age they're in. So because households are made up of people, two people, a man and a woman, and for a household to be fertile, those two people must be fertile. So what does, so I I had this thought when the Lord said to me, what does it look like for me to become a, a personally fertile, fruitful believer? And as I looked through the Bible, it looked like, well, there's three parts to this. There's, there's the self part, my character. There's skills. You know, because to navigate life, you have to have skills to be able to do things, build things, provide for your family, provide for your household. And then there's stuff. Eventually, you need stuff. But when I went to churches, there was a lot of the self. And there's very little of the other things offered to me as a believer. If you want to understand why most of my male friends are more likely to listen to Jordan Peterson and Yako Willink and Joe Rogan than they are to your pastor, it's because these men offer them a blueprint for successfully navigating a world that the church does not and, 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 you know, I interact with a lot of unbelievers in my work between farming conferences and homesteading conferences. And even among Christian men, you know, the, the people they discuss are almost never their pastor. And they'll say to you straight up, if, you know, you're not their pastor, it's because they don't respect them because he really doesn't have anything to offer them for them to successfully navigate the challenges and problems that life throws at them, especially when it comes to skills. And that is why people flock to these secular sources. And that's one reason a lot of my work focuses on giving people skills to successfully navigate a difficult world because people are looking for skills and not just believers, but all kinds of people. And I realized this was a wide open space and opportunity for me to gain social space, as Aaron has talked about, and have a platform and audience to speak to all kinds of people, and thus also get to speak to them about the foundation that makes sense of all of these things. Skills are so important and so neglected for modern people. Um, How many of you, when you graduated college, could raise animals? Anyone? How many of you can grow even a modicum of your own food? Purify water? How many of you can fix things around your house? Do you you see the skills deficit that that we've, and, and, and the skills deficit is driven by our culture for a very specific reason. Because when you lack skills, what is the only way to solve your problems? It's to spend money. Skillless people are dependent people, and dependent people are easy to control people. And so, on the personal fertility side, I'm constantly encouraging people to develop more skills. And if you have young children, to prioritize giving them skills that will set them up for success 
no matter what providence brings us in the coming decades. Um, you know, it, years ago, a friend gifted me an opportunity to take advanced firearms training at one of the most prestigious firearms school in America. Um, so off I go to Nevada, middle of the desert for a week um, to take advanced firearm training. And, you know, grueling 10 hour days, um, practical range classes. But then we had in between to kind of break things up, we had all of these more instructional classes on legal use of self-defense and theory of self-defense. But in every class, every instructor would constantly emphasize one thing. Any tool will do if you will do. do. Any tool will do if you will do. See, because most of us are thinking if we just had this one right thing, this one right opportunity, just this something that would solve our problems. But it made me realize it won't. What will solve my problems is, is the character I have built and the skills I have mastered. Because if I have those, I'll be able to solve most problems without having to spend any money. So we want to be personally fertile. Um, and then we want to build household fertility. So I'm going to describe what this looked like for us. Because our journey into building a fertile household is not a standard journey. Because um, again, I, I was, you know, I'm like the least likely person to be homesteading you will ever meet. Um, you know, like when, when I was a kid, I, 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 you know, I was so pale from the amount of time I spent playing video games and watching cartoons as a kid that the light bulb factory bought a photocopy of my body to use as like, like what does a hundred watt light bulb look like? Here's John, you know, like, um, I was just so bright white, um, from lack of sun exposure and things. And so 2000, I moved to Kentucky for seminary. Um, I was saved sophomore year of college, which would have been 1997. And about a year and a half into college, my local association of churches felt that I was called and gifted for ministry. So they wanted me to go to seminary to be trained. So I found myself packing my bags, moving down to Louisville and, and entering a world that was completely foreign to me. Names I did not understand, history I had never been told, people I'd never heard of. Um, and I'm at seminary, crunching through books. Um, I come across the work of Francis Schaeffer. Um, and man, I was just blown away reading Schaeffer um, and Calvin. You know, if you were to ask, like, who are the people who wander in the back of my head? It's like Edwards and Schaeffer and Calvin and Joel Salatin. Um, <laughs> And, and so that, that's like, you know, the, 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 the voices in my head. And so I'm in seminary um, and all of a sudden I become ill. How ill? I got down to 120 pounds. I'm six foot two. I turned sideways and I disappeared. I go to a doctor like most people do. Go to a doctor because doctors are who help you. But, you know, I'm already undergoing this worldview shift of how I understand the world. I go to my doctor. Doctor's like, yeah, you have duodenal ulcers. I'm like, that sounds really bad. He's like, no, we just give you drugs for that. I'm like, well, what did the drugs do to you? He stops. He looks at me. He says, I've never had a person ask me this. That should tell you all you need to know about the modern medical system. He's like, I never, I've actually never thought about this. I'd had a professor year before. Um, so again, since I didn't grow up in a Christian family, anytime I met a man who seemed to have a, a good, solid family life and good skills, I would buy them lunch. I did this for years. Every single person I met, I'd say, I want to buy you lunch. And just understand, I'm going to interrogate you while we're at lunch. <laughs> So come ready, because it's going to be, you know, I want my 90 minutes, and you're going to have five minutes to eat that lunch, but I'm going to pay for it, because I have questions for you. And so I'm sitting with this 
you know, professor at lunch who seemed to have really good relationship with his kids, really good relationship with his wife, because all, all I have in my family to look back on is bad, bad relationships between spouses, bad relationships between mother and father and siblings. And I'm asking him, you know, tell, tell me what are the most important things you've learned as a father and as a Christian? So I, I can take notes. He goes, he goes, you know, he goes, looks like you do this to a lot of people. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> So is it that obvious? Okay. He's like, let me tell you something wouldn't believe unless it had happened in my own life. Goes a couple years ago, one of my childs had, had a huge health crisis. I was also having some major health issues. He goes, and, and my wife like totally revamped our diet. What we considered food, where we got food from and how we prepared it. And so I put this in my Rolodex of just things, because at the time I didn't care. And I didn't have a girl yet. Um, and he also said, he goes, you know, once you have a girl, if this is of interest to you, you know, reach back out, we'll, we'll cover this ground, we'll plow this field. So a year later, I have duodenal ulcers. I am also in the middle of pursuing Jessica Carnes, who is now Jessica Moody. And I am deathly ill and thinking I might not make it to a wedding. So I called Dr. Guthrie and Dr. Guthrie gets his wife on the phone and she introduces us to a world that resonated with me because of especially my exposure to Schaefer. Um, Cause how many of you are familiar with Schaefer's ecological thought? I'm always amazed. I'm at, while I was at Southern, they had an entire journal dedicated to Francis Schaefer and not a single time anywhere in the journal do they mention his ecological and other thinking? Even though it's a theme in every single one of his and his wife's books, it's that easy to miss something that's so plainly there. So I'm really sick. I'm willing to try anything. And we go from shopping at like Sam's club and Walmart to wild oats and whole paycheck. Uh, <laughs> It's true, like, like, cause again, you know, like I was, you know, I'm just as far from these things at that time as you can possibly imagine. Um, but in about 10 months, I not only completely healed my duodenal ulcers, I used to have seasonal allergies so bad, Benad Benadryl sent me free stock options. <laughs> I had so many dental cavities as a kid that my dentist started to get letters from the EPA asking for drilling permit fees. <laughs> and I had enough antibiotics growing up to qualify as my own CAFO hog operation. <laughs> but like, no, and, and again, like it's true, like I was um, just so, so sick growing up, but, but that's normal in America. That's what we consider normal health in America, constant medication, consistent large scale health problems, um, you know, that, that's what we've normalized. And in nine months, I healed it all. Doctor, doctor's blown away. Doctor's like, this is impossible. I was like, that's fine. I was like, I just want you to stick that to be thing down me again. So you can see I did this with food. And so I became a true believer, you know, like, I, so, so I am like the ultimate you know, reformed, conservative, crunchy person. <laughs> you know, like, um, people just don't know what to do with me. Um, and, and now, like Michael, I share his antipathy towards essential oils, but that's about it. <laughs> um, you know, and so, um, and, and so my wife and I started from the very get-go, even when we were engaged, being productive because my life depended on it. Because we had to master all of these different skills in order to bring me back to health. And, and that's really what started us. And so I start reading all of these crazy books on food and nutrition and sleep. And, um, and that leads to, you know, well, when you start reading about food, well, then that makes you start thinking about farming. And when you start thinking about farming, then you start might wanting to have a cow or 20. 
you know, because how, how many of you have done that? You know, somebody over here is like, you know, should we buy one cow? Should we buy 15 cows? <laughs> They're cheaper by the dozen. I thought, if I have 12 acres. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> um, and so we're living in Louisville at the time. Um, I'm too young to pastor, but I'm getting close to graduating seminary. And I need something to do with myself. And I also want to do something that will let me have a platform with unbelievers. And if you remember the early mid 2000s, that was the first big wave of like the local food movement. How many of you remember Michael Pollan's books, you know, Omnivore's Dilemma? Um, How many of you have heard of Michael Pollan? Good. So, you know, because this is the kind of cultural space that we often miss in our evangelical reformed ghetto. And it's a shame we miss these things because it's such an opportunity to engage over shared space that is rapidly shrinking. And so I was like, you know, um, Aaron was talking about, you know, who runs the coffee shop? Usually uber liberal people who runs the bookstores, uber liberal people. Who usually runs your local food co-op? Uber liberal people. Well, Louisville didn't have a food co-op. I was like, I'm going to start a food co-op. I'm be the first like uber reformed, crunchy, conservative Christian male to ever start a food co-op in American history. (laughs) I'm never going to be able to preach in a church again. (laughs) It's true. So... I started a local food buying club back in 2006. And and it's crazy because like that led to me having opportunities to speak at all sorts of shared space platforms across America from Mother Earth News Fairs and Weston A. Price conferences to Paleo FX. Because what we did, we did with excellence. What we did we did with intention and what we did, we did to make our city and community a better place. So I didn't, you know, I didn't like every time somebody came through, I wasn't like sticking Jesus fishes, you know, on their raw milk, you know, like now it's Jesus milk, you know? uh, So I've seen some people try and do that. Really, it's a little weird. So I've had to think like a lot of you evangelical people, little weird. Um, So we started this food buying club. um, And at the same time, we started to build our household. And and again, we we were building a household from the ground up. And if you want to build a productive household, here is the absolute easiest way to do it. Because this is just what my wife and I did. And again, my wife and I had almost no skills when we married. You know, people look at like all the things we can do now that like, I could never do that. I can tell you if I can do it, it's going to be a cakewalk for you. <laughs> You're going to have such an easy time if I can get to this place. We chose two things each week that we wanted to learn or do as a family. That was it. Just two things. If we didn't knock them out that week, we did not beat ourselves up and self flagrate like we just try it again next week and that that's all we did for basically three years of marriage until we got to child number 2.3 and we were too tired to do anything else for a while (laughs) and we just made small incremental changes to our lifestyle until we had changed our entire life and focus and base of operations. And and it was amazing. You know, because when you think about modern houses, since especially the 1960s, two things simultaneously have happened to our homes. One is they have exploded in size, cost, and built-in conveniences. The average home size of homes built, you know, in the 1960s versus today, even as the number of children has gone down and the amount of time people spend in them has gone down. 
and the things people do in them has decreased. The, the homes themselves have become these lavish, empty palaces, almost like a mausoleum of what the family once was. And so we've built larger and larger homes, but what do we use them for? If we need money or resources, we don't generate those at home. If we need physical health, we go to gyms and parks and other places of recreation. If we need information, we go to schools and colleges and seminars and conferences and whatnot. But what are our homes really for in the modern world? All that's left is consumption. We go home to consume. And the home has become an empty place. Rather than being a staging area for kingdom advancement, cosmic war, and cultural change, our homes have been largely reduced to enemy-occupied territory. From the fridge to the television and everything in between. And so we wanted to build a home that we felt was built around biblical principles, a home that would be productive, and a home where our children would, instead of being economic liabilities would become economic assets as they grew up. If you do like a Google search on children and, and you know, like most things related to children, do you know it's one of the number one articles that comes up when you research having children? It's cost of having children. So, so if you put in, you know, like having children, cost of is like one of the top Google results. Because why? When most people think of having children, they don't think in terms of economic advantage and benefit. They think in terms of cost. Um, we were listening as a family to the original Peter Pan. How many of you remember the original Peter Pan? And, and in the book, the, the mother and father sit down and the dad's like some kind of bean pusher, you know, counter person. And th there's like four whole pages about them running the numbers on having children. And you see this in our literature, th this switch over from children being a blessing and an economic advantage and a part of a productive, useful household to children being something you better think long and hard about because they're going to crimp your style. And if they don't crimp your style, at the very least, they're going to crush your pocketbook. But that's not what the household is meant to be biblically. Children are meant to be a blessing, but they can only be a blessing if a household is productive. And so we need to recover building productive households. So we moved out of the city. People always say to me, I don't want to move out of the city. That's fine. I don't want you to move out of the city. I want to buy more land for my children and you just drive up the price. So you stay in the city. <laughs> but two of the people I know who have the most productive households I have ever seen live on, I think they're like one tenth or less acre lots in Louisville, Kentucky. And they raise 50% or more of their family's food among other things, in a space not even bigger than this room. You can be productive wherever the Lord has planted you. Now, if you want more land, that's great. I think land is a good thing. It's, you know, I, I personally, for my buying club, I'd love to have space on Main Street. But for my family, I want to have, you know, space on No Street. <laughs> but that's just how I'm wired. You might be wired differently. It's wonderful we're all wired differently because that's what makes up the body of Christ. But you can build a productive home wherever you are and whatever resources the Lord has given you. And, and, and I want to emphasize um, one reason I'm big on at least doing some food as part of your home. Really three reasons. Well, I think everybody should do at least some food growing. Uh, you know, first, it's just such a recurring theme in the Old Testament Again, when, when the Israelites are in exile in Babylon, God lays on them as a command that every single one of them is to have a garden. Did you ever think about that? 
every single Israelite carried off to Babylon was told to plant a garden. What does a garden give you? Food. And what is food? At its most basic level, food represents a level of independence from the, those around you. That's one reason food has always been so crucial. Um, I love this quote from C.S. Lewis in, in terms of this relationship. I believe a man is happier and happy in a richer way if he has the freeborn mind. But I doubt whether he can have this without economic independence, which the new society is abolishing. For economic independence allows an education not controlled by government. In an adult life, it is the man who needs and asks nothing of government, who can criticize its acts and snap his fingers at its ideology. Read Montaigne. That's the voice of a man with his legs under his own table, note owned space, eating the mutton and turnips raised on his own land. He's a man with a garden. Resistance is fertile. God understood that that means having a productive household that gives you a measure of independence from the things around you, especially when those things are hostile to you and your faith community. And, and you know, so, so gardening gives, gives the church this kind of independence. How many of you last year seriously started to run out of food during the initial wave of COVID craziness? How many of you didn't have toilet paper? So some of you got there. You, you, you know, you've seen this firsthand. So a, a productive household helps insulate you from these challenges and vagaries of life. It's a bulwark against bad times. It's by nature a place you're prepared and able to help soften the calamities and uncertainties that this world throws at us. Um, but, but you want to see really how practical this type of lifestyle is. If I were to ask you to name a politician who actually stands for the Constitution and other good things at the federal national level, who would you name? Thomas Massey and Rand Paul. What do any of you know about Massey? So, well, yeah, you all know that from watching me butcher chickens with him on Facebook. So, because Massey and I butcher chickens instead of the Constitution. Uh, so, how many of you know Massey went to MIT? Massey's like a super genius. Yes. There has not been a single year of Massey's life with Rhonda, his wife, that they have not grown a garden together. Massey understood. Massey became a congressman in 2012, picking up on a thread Michael mentioned yesterday. Massey ran for some odd little local office, county executor, I think it was, in his county and won. And then he ran for Congress the very next election and won. That's why little offices matter. Like, so Massey though in 2012 was part of that massive red tea party wave. How many of you remember that massive, so much hope? So, asked Massey a few years ago, how many people elected with you part of that tea party wave have hold, held true to those principles? Maybe. Him and one other guy. But what makes Massey different from the rest of them? He is independent. He lives on land he owns in a house he built himself from trees he fell with stone he quarried with the help of his children, with an off-grid electrical system he built, with a well he bore himself, and food he grows himself, and cows he raises himself. 
Massey needs nothing from no one. And thus, no one can strong harm him. Independence makes a very big difference to the strength of our witness. People always ask me, like, why can you speak so plainly? Now, I went to a prepper conference a number of years ago um, because they invited me to be a speaker at like one of the one of these big prepper conferences. And the first thing I said in one of my talks is you all are way too overweight. Like half of you can't even see your toes and you talk with your friends on secure chat channels about overthrowing the government. I'm like, come on. Like you can't even make it up the stairs without needing oxygen support. I'm like, do you think you're a Navy SEAL? People are like, how do you get away with it? Because I don't care. I don't need any of you. I don't. I, you know what? It would make me so happy If tomorrow the governor of Kentucky would roll out full vaccine passports to get food in my state. One is because I believe in the principle of war, never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. And number two, I would have two to 4,000 new clients at my buying club the very next day. Because we would never require a vaccine passport or any other silly things. So... I wanted to become a personally personally fertile person. Um, We have been working on ever since we married, building a fertile household that was internally fertile, but also externally engaging the world fertile. You'll get to meet one of my daughters tomorrow. Um, Whenever I go speak at conferences, I make my kids speak with me, have them do presentations because I don't want to raise weird homeschoolers like Michael (laughs) constantly talks about. So a productive household should not cut you off from engaging the world. It should provide multiple avenues and platforms for you doing just that. But the beauty of having churches with many productive households is that lets us build productive communities. So our buying club has about 150 to 200 member families. That's over half a million dollars of food spending per year that I get to reallocate. Who do I get to reallocate that to? Who do you think I look for? I look for other good, believing families and businesses. Because now I get to magnify one household enterprise and grow it into many many more throughout our community. And now we have half a dozen believing farmers all around Louisville, many of whom exist because of our buying club. Um, How many of you have heard of Marksbury Farm Market, the butchering facility? One of the reasons that butchering facility exists is because our buying club was their first chicken buyer. And now Kentucky has a whole new butchering option. Small economic reallocation in a community can make major long-term difference if it is managed and stewarded well. And just imagine that's with 150 families. The greater Louisville area has 1.2 million people. That is roughly 400,000 households. Only 150 of them use our buying club. Imagine if it was 1,500. Imagine if it was just 15,000. We would reshape the entire agricultural landscape for 100 miles in every direction. All through people, and a lot of these families don't get all of their food from our buying club. Most of them spend $100, $150 a week. Many spend 50 bucks a week. They still get food other places. Some of them grow their own food. But look at the difference it can make. So we want to move not just from household productivity to community productivity. Local, whenever possible, since that is where we can have the most influence and direct impact. But now that I also put on conferences or do other things or have an elderberry syrup business where we ship all over the country, I'm working with other people. So I want to point out Jason here. Um, Jason has a family business in rural Virginia called Seeds for Generations. How many other Christians now work for you? I know Rachel does. 
Does anyone else? Yeah, so he has a little seed business. Um, the, the seed market in America for seeds is massive. He has a little business that not only provides for his one family, but provides for two other families, three other families who work in the business. But then he has an affiliate program that benefits other businesses that partner with his business. So you have a garden, buy seeds from Jason. Jason. Because Jason is going to be reinvesting that money back into our communities and families. So we can all look. One thing I always ask people is what percentage of your budget goes to funding your enemies and what percentage of your budget goes to funding your allies? Because, you know, like I didn't grow up in the church. Um, so I had like no baggage when I became a Christian for how I read the Bible. So when Paul said, don't be unequally yoked to unbelievers, I just assumed from the beginning, like that ruled out my kids going to secular public education. That also kind of ruled out me being dependent on unbelievers for like all my basic needs. That seems like being yoked to them. You know, like, you know, if, if my food and water and everything I need to survive comes, comes from people who hate Christ, that doesn't seem like that's prudent to begin with. But also, why would I want to fund my enemies? That, that's the other thing that always has amazed me about conservatism in America, that we're so willing to fund our enemies. We think nothing of it. We, we, we pray like this morning, and we talk like this day that we're in a war, and then the lion's share of our economic resources, we funnel those to uh, who are launching beachhead attacks on every front on the little territory we still control. So resistance is fertile. We, we, we want to be like the Israelites in Babylon. We want to buy and control space. We want to build productive households. We want to be a blessing to our communities. But Michael wanted me to talk about the other side of this. That fertility leads to resistance. Um, it was a very special anniversary this year. Well, you know, I'll tell a quick story first. Um, some of you already know this story, but it was 2004, and I'm finally getting um, ready to propose to um, then Jessica Carnes, now Jessica Moody, and I'm taking her out to dinner. And she thinks we're going to a nice restaurant. I'm all dappered up. She thinks this is it. I am getting a ring tonight. This is the night I have been waiting for. So we're sitting at this nice restaurant and just chatting the night away. And I look at her. I say, hey, I said, I, I have something I want to tell you. And she's like, just, and she's like, yeah, I said, I'm probably going to go to jail one day. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's true. I, w I wanted to be, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be very upfront with people, especially people I'm going to marry. Um, so fast forward to Memorial Day weekend, 2011. Now, most of you don't know that the government has basically waged a two decades long war on local food. You should be aware of this. You should be aware that the FDA has said in writing that there is no fundamental right to choose what you eat and what you feed your family and who you get it from in a supposedly free nation. Um, but that, that, that's, you know, big topic for another time. So when I started this alternative local food buying club, um, I realized that I was painting a pretty big bullseye on my back. Because one of the reasons I did the club the way I did it is I realized I could never build a food business inside the regulated system that would let me reflect my values. In the regular food system, farmers get 20 cents on the dollar of what you spend. In my buying club food system, they get 80 cents on the dollar of what our members spent. And so I wanted something different. I could not do that inside of the regulated system. 
So I decided to creatively circumvent the labyrinth of government regulation and create something new. And I knew eventually that would probably cause them to come visit. And Memorial Day, um, 2011, they came. They came to our club. They served us with cease and desist and quarantine orders and threats of anybody, you know, violating these things will be fined, will be jailed. And will other hot wives, you know, be drawn and quartered and whatever things the king of Kentucky might do to them. Um, and, and, you know, th this is really where the rubber hits the road because it is so easy to talk about like, yeah, the government, they can't tell me what to do. It is another thing to be sitting on your couch on a Friday afternoon with a five-year-old, a four-year-old and a five-month-old. Say, am I really going to go to jail over raw milk? <laughs> Is this really a hill to die on? So it's a Friday afternoon of Memorial Day weekend. And you also have to understand up until this point, there had not been a single small farmer or alternative food business in America who had been raided by the government and walked away the winner. It was a long string of L's. So it's, it's not promising odds when you look at what had been going on. And people always ask me, you know, what, what convinced you to like go through with what you did? And it was two things. While I could have been jailed and fined and drugged through the court and separated from my children for an extended period of time, I realized that that was not the worst thing that could happen to my children. I realized that the worst thing that could happen to my children is they would see that all of my talk was empty and all of my courage was actually cowardice when it mattered. That was the first. I realized that there are things worse in this life than being separated from your family and drug off to jail. And that's being shown to be a coward and a hypocrite. But then the second one is I realized that if I did not fight this fight now, my children would have to. And when they fought it, it would be harder and it would be from a worse position. So if somebody's going to fight it, I might as well fight it for them. Well, now you have to fight a fight. And I love, I love fighting. You know, people, people like, why do you love martial arts so much? You're like, I play chess. I listen to Sun Tzu's Art of War. I listen to World War II. Um, you know, one of the things that always amazed me about, con you know, conservatism in America, both theologically and politically, is I look around at, at all of these people and I'm like, you know, you all have a strict adherence to wild E. Coyote tactics in a roadrunner world. This is how you all operate. You are like the definition of futility in action. Repeated futility in action. So it's like, if I'm going to fight the government, I'm going to win. You know, or if they take me to jail, I'm taking as many people with me as possible because judo is a backup plan and I'd rather have Jason as a cellmate than Bubba. Um, and so... It's true. Um, so we're raided by the Kentucky Health Department. Um, and I, I hatch a very simple plan. And, and, and this is a plan that the fact that more people across America did not use this last year broke my heart. Because in Kentucky, where our governor has been a complete run amuck tyrant, if just 20% of the businesses had said, I'm not going to comply, they would not have been able to enforce it. In hospital systems across America right now, if just a quarter of the nurses said, I will not be a guinea pig for an experimental vaccine, or even if I'm morally okay with the vaccine, I am against the coercion behind it, they would not be able to enforce it. Most of our problems are self-inflicted. Our compliance is what gives them power. So we did not comply. 
And out of, you know, hundred some 50 members of our buying club, I, I'd put up a little sign on the coolers of milk and say, you know, I, the undersigned in accordance with my God given and Kentucky constitutional rights am taking my milk. And if anyone at the Kentucky health department has a problem with this, they can contact me at this phone number. Man, like all but maybe two families in our buying club signed. And now the health department has a problem. Their problem is it's really easy to throw John in jail. But it's not really easy to throw John and Larry and Sarah and Susan and Bob and Jim and some of the few remaining productive tax-paying members of Kentucky society in jail. <laughs> we don't have many of them left in Kentucky to begin with. And so the health department had no choice but to walk away. So if you're fertile, you might meet resistance. And you have to be ready for it. And you have to fight to win. And you have to be ready for it. Men in here who have more secular jobs, what are you going to do if you become employable? Not, not employable, unemployable. Because a lot of the males I know see the writings on the wall at their companies with the wokeness training and all the other stuff. Churches, what will you do if America goes the direction of Australia? I have friends in other countries sending me pictures where they cannot go into grocery stores now without vaccine passports. What are you going to do? I've tried to build a life that will let me be fertile so that I can resist. And I hope that each of you will do the same. Thank you.